knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. Water is incredibly important to life on this planet as we know it, and it is quite abundant, covering 70% of the surface of the Earth in the form of oceans, and is home to the majority of biological organisms on Earth. It is the only naturally occurring substance on Earth that can be readily found in three physical states, solid, liquid, and gas. As we remember from our study of chemistry, water, or H2O, is made up of two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. What makes this seemingly simple compound so special is its polarity. There's a partial positive charge on one side and a partial negative charge on the other due to the polar OH bonds. The presence of two lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen atom gives water its bent shape, resulting in the overall net dipole. One water molecule attracts another via hydrogen bonds, and this is what creates surface tension in a group of water molecules. Next time it rains, check out all the droplets that form when the water comes into contact with a waterproof jacket. Specifically, the bonding that makes the water molecules stick together is called cohesion. This property helps plants take up water at their roots. Cohesion also contributes to water's high boiling point, which helps animals regulate body temperature. More on the physical properties of water in the general chemistry series. Given that water can dissolve a wide variety of molecules, it is known as the universal solvent. It's this ability that makes water such an invaluable life-sustaining force. On a biological level, water's role as a solvent helps cells transport and use substances like oxygen or nutrients. Water-based solutions like blood help carry molecules to necessary locations, like oxygen for respiration. Water also allows everything inside cells to have the right shape at the molecular level. As shape is critical for biochemical processes, this is also one of water's most important roles. Water is directly involved in many chemical reactions to build and break down important components of the cell. Photosynthesis, the process in plants that creates sugars for all life forms, and the oxygen we breathe, requires water. It's pretty amazing how a simple molecule is so universally important for organisms with diverse needs. Water is distributed and recycled through the biosphere via the hydrologic cycle, which involves the circulation of water in the Earth atmosphere system in a continuous manner. It has no beginning or end. But let's start in the ocean, as this is where 70% of Earth's water resides. The sun is the true driver of the hydrologic cycle, as it begins by heating the water in the oceans. Some of the water evaporates, turning from liquid to vapor. This water vapor is joined by water vapor from evapotranspiration, which is water that is either transpired from plants or evaporated from the soil. As this cumulative vapor rises into the air, it cools and eventually condenses into clouds. Air currents move clouds around the globe, and eventually cloud particles collide, grow, and fall out of the sky as rain, snow, or hail, known collectively as precipitation. Most precipitation falls back into the oceans. The precipitation that lands on the Earth's surface flows away from where it lands as runoff due to gravity. A portion enters rivers and streams, which eventually flow into the ocean, but the rest of the runoff and groundwater seepage can accumulate and get stored as freshwater in lakes. The runoff that doesn't flow into rivers soaks into the ground as infiltration and finds its way deep down underground into aquifers or saturated rock, which can store large amounts of freshwater for long periods of time. Infiltration that stays close to the surface can seep back into surface water bodies and the ocean as groundwater discharge, or it can emerge as freshwater springs. Of the world's total water, over 96% of it is salty. Of the total freshwater, over 68% is locked up in ice and glaciers, with another 30% of freshwater stored in the ground. Rivers and lakes that we use and enjoy actually make up less than 0.01% of the total water on the planet. When it comes to the marine environment, these aquatic areas have high levels of dissolved salt and include the open ocean, deep sea ocean, and coastal marine ecosystems like coral reefs and estuaries where tides meet streams. Each has different physical and biological characteristics. 
Coral reefs, for example, are incredibly diverse marine ecosystems, which in total may account for a quarter of all ocean species alone. Corals are slow growing, taking a long time to form. The fastest growing coral grows six inches per year, but most grow less than an inch per year. Marine algae supply much of the world's oxygen. Think of it as the rainforest of the sea. And it absorbs a large amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is increasing in amount year by year due to human-caused climate change. Within the ocean, we have four horizontal zones, the intertidal, pelagic, benthic, and abyssal. We discussed these in the geology series, so let's just briefly review. The intertidal zone is where the ocean meets the land. It is sometimes submerged and sometimes exposed as waves and tides come in and out. This zone can be rocky and act as home to algae, mollusks, snails, crabs, starfish, and small fish. The pelagic zone is further from land and home to many more species of fish, as well as mammals like whales and dolphins. This region is colder and temperature varies at different depths due to thermal stratification or a separation of waters due to varying temperatures and densities and the mixing of warm and cold currents. You can find a lot of seaweed here. Next is the benthic zone, which includes the sea floor, consisting of sand, silt, and dead organisms. The temperature here is quite cold and decreases with depth while approaching the abyssal zone, the deepest part of the ocean. While the benthic zone is rich in nutrients, supporting bacteria, fungi, sea anemones, marine worms, and more, the abyssal zone, while high in oxygen, is low in nutrients. However, it is home to a unique ecosystem. Openings in the seafloor called hydrothermal vents emit large amounts of hydrogen sulfide and other minerals that support several types of chemosynthetic bacteria. These bacteria do not use sunlight for food, but rather derive their energy from reactions involving inorganic chemicals. This, in turn, provides food for invertebrates and fish at these depths. Then there are estuaries, where salt water from the ocean mixes with fresh water from the land. You may also know estuaries as bays, lagoons, wetlands, and swamps. These ecosystems are adapted to cope with the challenge of the rise and fall of tides, as well as variations in water chemistry, primarily salinity. Despite this, estuaries are one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth, home to fish, shellfish, crustaceans, algae, plankton, and mangrove trees. Numerous animals rely on estuaries for nesting and breeding grounds. Freshwater ecosystems include surface features like lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, springs, and wetlands. They are either lentic, meaning slow-moving water, like that found in lakes, or lotic, consisting of fast-moving water, like with rivers. Wetlands occur where soil is saturated or inundated with water for at least part of the time. They do not contain the same dissolved substances in the water as marine ecosystems, so the animals and plants living there would not survive in marine ecosystems without some serious and rapid adaptations. Because fresh water does not contain salt, it's more susceptible to freezing and thawing. Thus, freshwater plants and animals have adapted to survive this process. They have respiratory structures adapted specifically for freshwater and have evolved reproductive and feeding behaviors that enable them to survive these temperature changes. The major zones in river ecosystems are determined by the riverbed's gradient, or tilt, or by the velocity of the current. Faster-moving turbulent water typically contains greater concentrations of dissolved oxygen, which supports greater biodiversity than slow-moving water. The ecology of running water thus is unique among aquatic habitats due to unidirectional flow, a state of continuous physical change, and a high degree of spatial and temporal microhabitats at all scales. Marine ecosystems are characterized by factors such as availability of light, food, and nutrients. Other factors include water temperature, depth, and salinity, as well as local topography. Changes in these conditions can change the composition of species that make up the marine community. 
In the ocean, the three vertical zones based on depth are the euphotic, dysphotic, and aphotic zones. The euphotic zone is the area where light can penetrate and where the vast majority of photosynthesis takes place. It goes down about 200 meters. The middle layer is the dysphotic, or twilight zone, where less light reaches. The third and deepest layer is the aphotic zone, and this layer is completely dark, very cold, and supports little life. This largely inhospitable zone makes up a surprising 80% of the ocean. When it comes to dissolved oxygen, the level of free oxygen present in water, levels that are too high or too low can harm aquatic life. Oxygen decline can reduce biodiversity, lead to shifts in species distributions, and even expand algal blooms. There is an inverse relationship between dissolved oxygen and temperature. As the temperature of the water increases, dissolved oxygen levels decrease. High temperatures can reduce the solubility of oxygen in water. So warm water does hold less oxygen than cold water. Excess levels of nutrients can lead to rapid plant growth, resulting in the depletion of dissolved oxygen due to increased organic matter, as well as respiration and decomposition rates. With various aquatic ecosystems covered, let's move forward and take a look at the land next. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.